So I'm going into my third week of my neurology rotation and I'm gonna be on the stroke service this week. Today was my first day, so I can talk a little bit about the workflow. So the stroke team is essentially responsible for managing the care of any patient that comes in with a suspected or confirmed stroke. So a lot of the times patients will come into the ED um, either by themselves or via ambulance with certain symptoms that are concerning for a stroke, uh, usually some sort of focal neurologic deficit like weakness in one of their limbs, a facial droop, something like that. Uh, what happens is you call a code stroke, which is essentially a protocol to get the proper workup for someone to determine if they have a stroke and to see if you should intervene. Um, stroke along with heart attack or one of these things that are super time sensitive and the faster you get a patient triaged, diagnosed and treated, the better their outcomes are gonna be. Especially with stroke, uh, you know, if it's something that is treatable and you can give a certain medication or do some intervention procedure and sort of remove the clot, the patient has a much better chance of recovering all of the functions that they currently don't have. Whether that be, you know, not being able to talk or even like understand speech, not being able to move certain limbs, not being able to see, so, um, you know, all of these are super important to our quality of life and our function day to day. So uh, having a system that is fast and efficient and sort of regimented is really helpful to make sure that we can diagnose patients properly with strokes and then treat them as fast as possible. So usually what happens at Code Strokes, at least in my hospital, is, you know, the ER physician will initially see the patient right when they come in. A lot of the times if the patient is coming in via ambulance, um, they'll call ahead to the hospital and say like, hey, like we're gonna be there in two minutes with someone who might be having a stroke. So, so the hospital is able to identify some ER physicians that will examine the patient immediately. Um, they do a brief neurological uh, exam to see if in fact they do have signs concerning of a stroke. If they think that they do, then they'll initiate the code stroke, and then someone from the neurology team will go and examine the patient. At one of the EDs I work at, uh, there's no neurology residents there, so a group of NPs uh, are on the stroke team. They do that evaluation, um, but at the hospital that I'm at currently, there are neurology residents, so the residents are the ones who do that. Um, Interestingly enough, the people that I work with this week on the stroke team are not responsible for that. The team that I'm on is like once a patient is actually admitted. We have a separate consult team for the residents where they're kind of responsible for responding to those um, sort of acute things in the ED. So um, once someone from the neurology team examines them, they're like, yep, we're gonna do a code stroke. They uh, will probably redo uh, the exam to determine like how severe their symptoms are and then they'll put them into the CT um, and what they're doing is they're looking to see if there's any sort of blood in the brain so when you break down strokes there's two different kinds there's an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke so ischemic is usually what most people think of when they think of stroke um, it is a blockage in one of the arteries in the brain um, and very similar to a heart attack so for whatever reason a artery is clogged it's not providing blood to that area of the brain and that's why you're having the neurological symptoms blocking the blood flow causes ischemia so that's why it's called an ischemic stroke um, conversely there's a hemorrhagic stroke which is caused by a bleed and it's really important to differentiate the two even if they can cause similar symptoms because the treatment is completely different and then breaking down ischemic stroke um, there's two different kinds there's thrombotic and embolic Thrombotic basically means um, the issue is coming from somewhere like already in that artery. Uh, so it's usually atherosclerosis and then an embolic is coming from a different area. So usually the heart in patients that have AFib. But the acute cause of an ischemic stroke doesn't really matter. They're gonna be managed kind of the same way. So like I said, uh, the patient will get a CT of their head to see if there's any blood in the brain. And the reason to do that is to rule out a hemorrhagic stroke. Like I said, ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes are managed completely differently. So sort of the point of the code stroke is to determine if the patient, one, has an ischemic stroke, and two, if it's if their symptoms are severe enough to 
um, warrants some sort of thrombolytic therapy. So we have a few medications, uh, TPA or TNK, that can be given to sort of bust up the blood clot in their brain. And by, by busting up the clot, you hope to restore blood flow and um, sort of get rid of the stroke. With that being said, the reason the CT head is so important is because if someone is bleeding in the brain, giving those kind of medications is gonna make things catastrophically worse. Um, have a really high chance of mortality if you give one of those medications if someone's already bleeding they're not going to be able to uh you know form a clot plug in that artery to stop the bleeding and they could just bleed out so that's why it's so important you do the ct head to make sure they're not bleeding so once the ct head is done uh sometimes i'll also do a ct angio you're putting dye into the patient's vessels you get a picture of them and that's another way to see if there's some sort of bleed after those two imaging things have been done uh you know the team comes together and they're like well we don't see any blood they have very severe symptoms, they can't move the whole right side of their body, they can't speak, then they make the decision to give uh, the clot buster or not. Usually for patients where, you know, they have very, very mild symptoms or like their presenting symptoms have already resolved, they might not give it um, because the risk, you know, benefit ratio is not worth it. Because even if the CT head is negative for any blood, there's always a chance of bleeding when you give this medication, it could induce a bleed. So that's kind of the basics of the code stroke and then depending on you know what happens to the patient they'll either put in for observation so some of the patients who are um, maybe sort of questionable if they had a stroke or not uh, their symptoms resolved without any medication uh, they might be put in the observation area or they might be admitted directly to the stroke team but either way um, that's where like my team comes in um, we're responsible for doing further workup of these patients um, but I'll get into that more a little bit later. All right, so it is Wednesday and I have a few more days of stroke under my belt. Honestly, I've been enjoying it. Um, you know, to talk a little bit more about what we actually do once a patient is admitted to the stroke team, there is a whole extensive workup that has to go on to try to determine the cause of the stroke. So sometimes it's um, pretty clear if you know a patient has a history of a, st a stroke or they have just a bunch of risk factors. If someone has AFib, you can you know pretty much guess that that was the cause of their stroke. But sometimes a patient comes in, no past medical history. They might be really young, and you have to do an extensive workup to. Um, you know, either determine the cause or just sort of stratify them and based based on risk factors. So the first part of working someone up for a stroke happens during the code stroke with the CT head, CT angio. Um, usually with the CT angio, you're able to see um, if a patient has any blockages in their arteries or if they have like aneurysms or other things that might have caused their stroke or predisposed them to one in the future. There's a bunch of lab tests that you do. Uh, one, we check lipids to see someone's risk of developing atherosclerosis, similar to what happens in the coronary arteries for a heart attack. We test their A1C to see if they have diabetes because diabetes is also a known risk factor for that. And then the other two big things is we usually get an MRI. So the MRI is sort of the gold standard for determining where the stroke actually occurred. And then the last part of it is to get an echo. Uh, the echo is to check for the function of the heart and to see if there's any clots inside of it. So AFib is a big reason why people get embolic strokes. So what happens is in AFib, your heart is not contracting properly. It's just kind of um, twitching almost is a way to describe it. And that causes stasis of blood flow. And when blood isn't flowing properly, it can clot. If it clots in the heart, then if it eventually gets dislodged, it can go up into the brain and cause a stroke. So the echo is to look at the heart and see if it has any sort of clot in it because that will be really dangerous for the patient. So back to the MRI, um, I've learned so much about MRIs this week and I've been getting a little bit better at reading them, still still not perfect, but um, one thing that I didn't really realize about MRIs is there's so many different views and types that they get and they can look at. Um, so I won't go through them all, but the basic way that neurologists 
look at MRIs for strokes is they have three different sort of views. They have the DWI, the ADC, and then a T2 flare. And the details of that isn't really necessary, but basically by looking at these three views and looking at the patterns of what the images show you, you can see either acute or chronic strokes. The first thing they look at is the DWI. It will you know, give you a really good picture of the brain. And then if there is some sort of acute stroke, it'll show up bright. Then, but that doesn't sort of prove that there is a stroke. Then you have to look at the same cut in the ADC to compare it to the DWI, because if it in fact is a stroke, part that is bright on the DWI should be dark on the ADC. That kind of confirms that there's an acute stroke. Um, if something is really acute, you won't really see any changes on the T2 flare. That is more for chronic things. One thing I've been so surprised to see this week is strokes are not an old person disease. Um, I've seen many people who are a lot younger than I thought would have strokes. So we've had two patients this week in their 30s who have had strokes and they've had both hemorrhagic and embolic ones. So these patients, it's really important to do a thorough workup to determine why they had it because people who are 30 probably don't have any atherosclerosis. That is something that develops over decades and decades. Um, so we need to know why they got a stroke. Um, a lot of the times it's due to something cardiac. Uh, sometimes people will have brain aneurysms, which can rupture and then cause a hemorrhagic stroke. So that was what happened to one of the patients uh, this week. And then also people will have uh, clotting disorders where their blood clots a lot more rapidly than it should, which predisposes them to blood clots that will then travel up to the brain. Um, one of the patients was literally like out of a uh, U-World vignette. So she was working out with her husband and he noticed a left facial droop. Um, so they came to the ER, or worked her for a stroke. Um, the symptoms did go away, so she didn't need any clot busters or anything. After all of the workup, we determined that there was a hole in her heart. So there's this thing called a paradoxical stroke where usually the place that embolic strokes come from is the left side of the heart in someone with AFib. So there's some sort of clot in the left side of their heart and eventually it gets dislodged and goes up to the brain. Now, sometimes patients can have DVTs uh, sort of in their leg or really wherever. And usually when DVTs get dislodged, they go into the right side of the heart because that's where the venous system drains into. And then once it leaves the heart, it actually goes to the lungs and that's how you get a pulmonary embolism. Usually there's no way way for things in the venous system to get to the left heart without getting stuck in the lungs. However, patients who have a PFO or a patent foramen ovale, that is actually possible. So when you're born, you have this little hole in your heart that connects you to atria and sometimes it never closes. So when patients have that and they have a DVT that gets dislodged and goes in the heart, sometimes instead of shooting into their lungs, it goes from their right atrium to their left, and then it's in the left side of the heart and it can go anywhere a normal stroke would go. So this patient, uh, she had no idea she had this hole in her heart until she had this stroke. So for whatever reason, she had a small DVD probably. She didn't have like the classic symptoms of it, but did develop one, went to her heart, crossed sides, and then went up to her brain. Um, I mean, I don't know how common this is, but the fact that I've seen it in my first three days being on stroke, it's honestly very surprising. It is Saturday, so I've wrapped up my stroke week, and honestly, it was my favorite week of neurology so far. I don't know if any of the other weeks are gonna top it. We'll see, but I really enjoyed the process of learning about strokes and working them up. So this isn't exclusive to strokes in terms of fields of neurology, but 
I think that strokes in particular rely heavily on the physical exam. A lot of neurology is localizing lesions in the brain or the spinal cord with your physical exam, but I think it's so clear and makes so much sense in stroke. We learn in medical school and preclinical like the classic presentations of different kinds of strokes. So if you have leg weakness, you have a stroke in your ACA, if you have arm or face weakness, it's in your MCA. If you have vision issues, it can be the PCA. Even with that, you can you start to learn how to localize different things, but really using your physical exam um, is your best tool for determining where the stroke is. A lot of the residents say that, you know, a good neurologist can pretty much diagnose people 80% of the time just from their exam. Um, their, the imaging really isn't always necessary. So I do really like that about neurology and specifically stroke because the fact that you can go to a patient at the bedside, do a bunch of physical exams and use your brain to localize something and know what is going on really appeals to me. Now with that being said, I have seen this week that it's not always cut and dry. Um, we did have a few patients where they had symptoms that could have either been a brainstem stroke or um, like a thalamic or intercapsule stroke. So, so in those cases, you do need the imaging to verify what is going on. And the resident was kind of joking. He was like, yeah, anytime a patient comes in with these symptoms, we just flip a coin to see if it is going to be the brainstem or not, because it's, it's sometimes really hard to tell if um, it's a brainstem stroke or somewhere else if they don't have cranial nerve involvement. So that's pretty much it for stroke week. Um, yesterday I was able to have a really nice day. I worked a lot in the morning, did a practice test, all that. Then I went to the beach with Mackenzie and uh, two of her classmates. So that was great. It's finally getting warm enough here to be able to go to the beach pretty often. Being 10 minutes from the beach is so nice. It's something that I've never really experienced before and I'm just getting more excited for the summer to be able to do that a lot more. All right, well, that is gonna do it for today's video. If you enjoyed, please be sure to leave a like below and subscribe if you wanna see videos like this in the future. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one.